Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, friends and colleagues in languages. Uh, thank you for your interest in my today's presentation. I believe we all agree that defending and promoting uh, indigenous, endangered minority languages is a noble cause. But today I would like to discuss what in particular we as language learners, language enthusiasts, could do about it, could contribute to uh, their development and to their preservation, perhaps. So I'm going to speak about developing learning materials for smaller languages. So I use the word small, smaller languages just as a simple term, because behind this you can imagine all other different uh, technical words like endangered languages, indigenous languages, minority languages. I'm not concentrating on the difference between these different terms. Here I'll, I'll just refer to smaller languages, that is, the ones that are less socially prestigious, less uh, economically supported than the big international languages we all uh, know. So let's begin with the uh, constatations, the, what the state of affairs is. So in the first place, we must recognize that most linguists and language learners are concentrated on big international languages like English, French, Chinese, and, and others. So there are many learning materials for these languages, and we have no difficulty accessing them. It would probably not be too far from the truth to say that until recently, even most polyglots have concentrated on European languages in the first place, even those who do really know many languages, but those would normally be European languages. In the recent years, I observed that Asian languages are entering the repertoire of polyglots, Chinese, Japanese, Arabic. There are more and more speakers um, in the polyglot community, uh, more and more speakers of, this, of, this, of these languages. Yet, minority languages, some smaller, rare languages spoken in remote islands or territories, it's quite unusual to find a speaker of those, a practical uh, learner of those languages, even among polyglots. The next point is that most publications on those smaller languages, which actually constitute most of the languages of the world, out of those six or seven thousand languages that exist in the world, most of them are uh, small languages that I'm uh, referring to today. And most publications on those languages that actually exist are usually dictionaries, uh, grammar descriptions, <coughs> or academic research monographs. There are not really many learning materials for them. So if you are an enthusiast who wants to practically learn this language, to go to the community and speak to the, with the native speakers and do something about this language, you can't really find uh, many materials to help uh, yourself in this enterprise. And one more point. Uh, that perhaps has not been appreciated enough in the previous uh, years in the, in the sphere of uh, the study of minority languages from the point of view of academic linguistics is that practical learning materials, educational materials for the teaching and learning of smaller languages are an instrument of uh, language planning in relation to these languages and are actually a factor of language vitality, of the capacity for survival and for preservation of these languages. So uh, this year is the International Year of Indigenous Languages proclaimed by the United Nations. Uh, there are conferences throughout the world and academic linguists also pay attention to the small languages. And according to the latest uh, data from these conferences available to me, it seems that uh, the current state of affairs is such that speak, native speakers of these small languages, they now believe that the major factor for the survival of their languages is uh, the existence of school teaching in these languages and that there should be a standard written form of these languages. So creating alphabets, creating uh, primary learning materials for school children in these languages are uh, a priority for their future. Now, speaking of the pedagogy of smaller languages, I would have to start uh, by saying that I don't really see any significant intrinsic difference in teaching and learning minority and say, 
non-minorities, smaller and bigger languages. They're just languages from the linguistic point of view. Some of them are indeed, uh, have some rare grammatical features or some unusual sounds and so on, which may uh, make the process of learning a little bit more complicated. But otherwise, uh, the methodology of language learning, language acquisition is basically the same. This is fundamental principles of uh, brain work, of psychology, of uh, information retainment in memory, and so on. So there is no real difference. We should take the best of uh, research, the best of what we know about language acquisition in general, and apply it to the study, to the acquisition of smaller languages. But the major problem with regard to them is, I believe, the absence of fully featured uh, learning materials. So if you wish to study one of those, being a language activist, a supporter of this native language and cultural community, uh, you would have a hard time finding anything to start your study process with. Uh, besides, uh, these smaller languages are in, so to say, non-standard so social situations uh, because they don't have big communities that could support them, they don't have education systems behind them, they don't have businesses uh, behind them spoken and conducted in those languages, and at the same time they're also beyond the mainstream of language education, right? There may not be any schooling in these languages, there may not be syllab syllabi for these languages on universal level, and so on and so on. So this means that to work in this direction, you don't only just start, take a textbook, do research, publish papers, you have to break stereotypes, you have to popularize the whole issue, and to create uses which are not perhaps immediately uh, obvious to the general public. And as I, as I have already mentioned, it's recognized that teaching in these languages is intrinsic, is essential to their survival. Now, to go into a little bit more detail, so taking the general principles of what we know about general principles of language acquisition and applying them to the smaller languages of this world, uh, we would probably see two possible situations of learning and teaching these languages. So the first situation is, then, is when uh, extensive input, that is basically speech, right, material in the language that you can perceive, oral and written texts, when this extensive input of the language is normally supplied through the tradition of native speakers. So there is a community, there are different generations, parents speak this language to their children, and this is passed from generation to generation. So this is the, no the natural order, isn't it? So I if this is the situation for a given small language, uh, then those willing to support it should work in the direction of language planning. So the language is already there, it, it lives. It's, uh, it's more or less uh, okay if the input is there. So in this case, to support it, to promote it, to develop it, you create alphabets if, it's, does, if it doesn't have an alphabet yet. You create terminology for different new fields of, of life, technology and so on that haven't been covered by this language before. Uh, and literature, you write literature that can again be taught in school, that can be read by native speakers, because this will increase the vitality of the language. You, you also promote the cultural identity of the native speakers so that they associate themselves and their culture, their families, their native land with this language, and you teach language standards. You develop those standards if they don't exist, and you teach them so that there is a standard form of the language which then can survive. Now, the second situation is when there is not enough natural input of the language, when it's dying out little by little, when the previous generations stop speaking the language to the following ones, to their children. So the input is not supplied, and this is just neurologically necessary for language acquisition. I'll uh, say a couple of words uh, on it in more detail uh, soon. So in this case, the, the priority is to facilitate the input, to make sure that it is supplied, either through uh, the communication between the remaining native speakers or through some perhaps, so to say, artificial um, instruments. So the, the task here is to create 
uh, material that would provide language models, language patterns, and vocabulary for needs of communication that those acquiring the language could assimilate and then uh, use. Now, to speak of the general principles of language learning, uh, which most of us, I believe here, have practiced, have experienced, and we feel and understand them more or less, they're basic, basic psychological things, essentially. But the most important thing is uh, the inputs. I'm a strong believer in this uh, theory, and it's not just a theory, it's based on extensive uh, empirical data and research. I won't go into detail explaining where I got these numbers from. I can uh, answer this question if necessary. Uh, but according to the latest uh, data available to me, f f to reach uh, the level of a four-year-old a uh, child in one's first language, in one's native language, uh, one needs an input of about 30 million words, which is uh, quite a lot. There's hours and hours and hours, thousands of hours of listening to the language. So a four-year-old uh, boy or girl, she or he listens to this language all through these four years, basically, maybe half of the day when he or she is not sleeping. So this is extensive input. So to reach the level of a four-year-old uh, child, one needs a vo an input of uh, 30 million words, approximately. Now, speaking of foreign languages, of second language acquisition, of learning uh, a foreign language, it's much. Uh, the good news is that the input is much uh, humbler in this case. You don't need 30 million words. It seems that uh, about one million words of inputs in foreign language acquisition is enough to reach the uh, level B1 or B2, so the intermediate level, so to say, in a given uh, foreign language. So the first thing in supporting the local uh, minority language is to make sure that sufficient inputs, uh, about 30 million words for the level of a four-year-old, and obviously more for the subsequent ages, uh, is supplied uh, to the uh, younger generations acquiring this language. Now, uh, also practical experience, empirical data and research uh, show that uh, comprehension is a natural priority in language acquisition. So everything comes into our brain through comprehension. So before we are able to say anything, we are already able to understand many things. Before a child uh, dares to utter a couple of phrases in his native language, he has for a long time been able to understand what uh, people and parents around him have been uh, saying to him. So comprehension is a priority. One shouldn't uh, press so much for production of the language, so to be to expect to pe people to speak this language immediately, but one should work on the comprehension capacity. This will naturally, with time, lead to an increase in the production capacity. For example, the case uh, with Irish uh, is that over the latest years, although the n number of active speakers were those quite uh, small in Ireland, despite the national policy and support from the government and so on, still uh, it seems that the situation is improving because the comprehension capacity is quite developed in the population, so people are able to actually understand TV programs uh, in Irish, the speeches that used to be just symbolic phrases at the beginning of some meetings and so on to support national identity, so to say, they are now longer in Irish, so the audiences are able of understanding uh, these speeches. So this is a good sign, and this is actually shows us that the, the gateway is comprehension. Now, priority of oral speech, obviously, because language is essentially speech, right? There are many languages which don't have alphabets or written forms. Yes, they are human languages and they have speakers and they are passed from generation to generation. So on the brain level, brain perceives language as speech, as sound, essentially. Then writing is a secondary system that helps us uh, fix oral speech in some form that we can reproduce and store, basically preserve in time and space. And uh, the priority of dialogue should also be 
uh, a major point in designing a methodology of uh, language learning, also with regard to small languages. That is the, the most natural form of speech as a dialogue. Uh, it's, it comes first before monologues, descriptions, long paragraphs of uh, reflections on something. So the first, the form of text, the form of material we should provide in the first place for learners is dialogues. No, positive emotions, I think it's needless to say anything about this. We all understand that language is largely a psychological issue. There's a lot of emotional things involved in language acquisition. So fear is destructive, it should be expelled. Motivation, interest, relevance, the feeling that what you're learning, what you're hearing or reading in the language is meaningful to you, is relevant to your needs is in, and interests, is essential. This actually stimulates brain to invest its resources, its energy resources into this actually quite a energy consuming work of acquiring and processing new information. Now, consistency and daily study in learning a language, I think is also obvious to all of us here. And parallel text as a desirable type and a very useful tool, uh, I think is also, uh, we all appreciate this fact that parallel text are very useful. I'm not going to go into detail explaining how it works. There was a wonderful presentation by Dr. Van der Waal at last year's conference in Ljubljana about parallel bilingual text. So uh, I would just say that probably they work well because um, Parallel texts make inputs comprehensible. We can just easily take a lot of texts and provide a parallel translation, and then without much grammar and explanation, you make input comprehensible. Now, let's just have a look at what, uh, say, learning materials, efficient learning materials that many of us use look like. Because they obviously should be models for us in designing learning materials for smaller languages. If this kind of thing works for bigger languages, then apparently this is something we should be aiming for in supporting uh, smaller language education, so to say. So it's just to name a few uh, more uh, well-known ones. So parallel text, Pimster, Asimil, video courses, uh, textbooks based on daily study with parallel translation explanations and so on. Well, just to name a few. Now, but speaking of um, smaller languages, you don't find this diversity as, I've, as I have already mentioned. I just checked yes, yesterday uh, the websites of the major uh, producers of learning materials, so Pimster, Michel Thomas, Glossik, and Asimil, and this is the information I've got. So Michel Thomas only has a, a course for Irish, so of the languages that we could consider as being smaller or minority or endangered or something like this. The rest are quite well-off languages, so to say. So only Irish. Pimster has Irish and Ojibwe. Uh, it's a North American indigenous language. Um, Glossik, as we learned yesterday, has uh, courses for Austronesian languages of Taiwan and probably some others, as Michael Campbell uh, explained. So Pro Glasgow probably has the largest variety so far of materials available for rare, more obscure, and uh, smaller languages. Now, but for me, the best example of uh, a ready-to-use learning material for a smaller language uh, is the series of textbooks, self-study textbooks by Asimil for the, what they call, regional languages of France, that is Breton, uh, Occitan, and uh, Corse. They are indeed in not very favorable situations, and according to the latest data available to me from France, Occitan is practically dead, although there are a couple of maybe uh, institutions that sometimes may offer a course class accredit in Occitan, but this is just uh, kind of uh, a remainder. People don't really uh, speak it, don't really use it. It only remained in the form of the southern accent in French. Uh, this is what uh, French linguists uh, tell me. You can compare it to the situation in uh, Catalonia, for example, in Spain, right? Th these are quite related languages. So it's quite a different thing. So it's 
totally dependent on the national pol policy in this case. So to praise ASML for this thing, they have a wonderful series in the same sans pen, without difficulty, without toil, series of textbooks for regional languages, just the same ones as we use for Spanish, Russian, Chinese, or whatever. So the same kind of textbooks with parallel text, with uh, audio recordings, with commentary and everything are available for these regional languages too. So here we have uh, their covers, and some of them have been uh, printed several times, and there are newer editions. So this is, for example, was a, a spread of pages from uh, one of the older editions of the Occitan textbook. Uh, looks like it's just the traditional form of an ASML lesson, isn't it? So you have parallel uh, text in the target language in the left, translation on the right side, and notes as commentary with reference to grammar and vocabulary used in this particular dialogue or small sentence or whatever. With pictures, with uh, at the bottom of the page you have phonetic transcription to help you uh, pronounce it. And there are video, uh, audio recordings uh, for this available too. Now this is a newer version for Occitan, which is actually now available from, uh, from uh, ASML. So first lesson of an uh, Occitan textbook by ASML. So again, dialogue, translation, pictures, notes, recordings, all is available. So I think this is the kind of material we should be aiming for if we want to create uh, textbooks, educational support for smaller languages. So this is a good example. Now to take some truly rare languages, some, something that uh, we don't see often or don't really uh, find materials for if we wish to learn them. I've gathered together here samples, suggested samples, something that I can use as, uh, as an example of what a learning material might look like if some of us here decide to uh, create materials for these languages or cooperate with native speakers, native communities um, in, in this uh, project. So VEPS is a uh, language uh, spoken in uh, northwestern Russia. It belongs to the Finno Ugric group of the Uralic language family. It has very few number of speakers, maybe three to five thousand, about that much, about that many. Uh, Newar is a language spoken in Nepal, in the Kathmandu Valley. It has uh, a much larger number of speakers than. Uh, VEPs, but yet it co it's considered endangered according to uh, the uh, UNO data, ethnologue. So despite the several hundred thousand of speakers, I believe, it's still considered an endangered language. It belongs to the uh, Tibeto-Burman group of the Sino-Tibetan family. And Shogni is uh, an Indo-Iranian language, so Indo-European. Uh, which is spoken in some areas of Afghanistan and Tajikistan, so in the uh, Pamir Mountains. So here are some examples. This is uh, acknowledgments to uh, people who helped, native speakers who have helped produce these materials. So this is a very simple parallel text, as you, as you can see, with a VAPS dialogue on the left side, so Russian translation in the middle, because obviously you would work through the medium of Russian as it's spoken to in, in the territory of, uh, of the Russian Federation. And so those vanishing speakers of VAPS would be speakers of uh, Russian at the same time, apparently. So this uh, English is just for reference purposes here. So we have VAPS dialogue, Russian translation, uh, bilingual, small bilingual text with small comments. That would explain some features of the language present in this particular piece of text. Now, something similar for uh, Newar or Newari. So you have the Newar text in the uh, traditional script. Uh, obviously, in this case, if you are working with uh, well, non-native speakers who would apparently know the script from other languages who use uh, similar scripts spoken in the area. But if you're aiming for, say, an external learner, you would need a phonetic transcription. So this, this is the principle of phonetic basis if the system of writing is too distant from yours or, is this, or there is a big discrepancy between pronunciation and uh, the script. So this is also a simple bilingual text. But... Uh, 
with a phonetic transcription in this case. And a different form of a um, learning material, also a dialogue, but presented in a different manner. I actually took it from a graduation paper of one linguistics uh, student uh, in Russia who wrote uh, her thesis about learning materials for her native Shugni language. So this is a dialogue in, Shug in Shugni in both phase, then in cursive, kind of uh, lighter uh, writing. This is a Russian translation and in blue, obviously, English. So this is a different way of presenting um, parallel explanations, parallel translations, not in the form of a column, but right inside the text. Maybe you could call it interlinear or uh, kind of internalized parallel text, so to say. Now, to generalize it a little bit, uh, what I believe are the features of an optimal textbook that would, would guarantee that it would work better than something else uh, with regard to helping someone make full use of this learning material to progress in the language. So I would say that the optimal and the easiest to create form of a learning material, especially in the case of smaller languages, is a parallel text with a commentary. So you just accumulate text in this uh, particular target language. It can be uh, transcripts of conversations by native speakers. It can be existing written texts if they exist in the written form, and you just provide a bilingual translation either in the local language that the, uh, the bigger local language, so to say, that the native community uses, uh, language of the country, if you are educating or if you help learn this language, uh, people from this native community, if it's a, uh, an external learner from Europe or elsewhere, then you would obviously use the, uh, one of the major European languages. Uh, lessons should be portioned for daily study, so it shouldn't be just a huge, big text without any divisions. So it's better to uh, divide it into small portions, just as, as uh, in the case of ASML. It should be self-sufficient, so that the particular textbook that you produce should be sufficient, self-sufficient, sufficient in itself. Uh, that is, you shouldn't, the learner shouldn't need anything else besides this particular textbook for the period of study which this textbook is supposed to cover. So it if it takes a month or three months or whatever, uh, half a year to work with this textbook, you should have in it everything that you need. So parallel translation, maybe vocabulary lists, grammar reference, explanations, uh, whatever. So you, you, you shouldn't need a separate volume of uh, academic grammar or a big dictionary in addition to this if you're just starting to learn this language. Now, it's also very helpful, very uh, productive to ensure that the textbook contains what I call dialogue with readers, when the author or the methodologist be, who stands behind this language addresses actually the learner in this text, not just by providing the text and learning materials and explanations, but actually has some, so to say, explanatory sections from, from time to time, not only at the beginning saying that, well, you shouldn't worry if you don't understand this particular grammar feature because in maybe in, in 20 lessons you will come across another text where, which will make it uh, obvious to you and so on. So to maintain, kind of, so to say, uh, psychological contact with the learner, with the reader, if it's a textbook without a teacher, so that he would be, would be motivated throughout the whole process of working with this particular uh, learning uh, resource. And it would be optimal if your textbook uh, actually has the form of a continuing story, if there is some plot behind it. So if it's not just isolated uh, lessons, number one about buying apples in the market, and number two about what are trees in the, in the woods, uh, it's better to have a continuous story preferably of detect detective nature, so that the, the learner would be actually uh, eager to, to follow and to read and to learn more what's going to happen there, because this is very natural. So language is acquired best when it works as language, and language is an instrument of communication. Well, it's not a target in itself, but when it works as a gateway to the content you want to access, which is of interest, of relevance to you. So this is something I call a novel textbook, so a novel-like textbook. So if someone writes something like this, this would be uh, worth uh, praise, definitely. There are things like this available for some of the major languages, and this would be great to use this technique in smaller languages, too. 
So finally, what can polyglots do about it all? So obviously, a polyglot that is a possessor of one of the best brains with regard to language and language acquisition in the world could learn a minority language. It would be much easier, I guess, for a polyglot to do this than for a regular person in terms of motivation, in terms of understanding the importance, the value of such an enterprise, and in terms of just knowing how this is done. It would be much easier for us to just accept this challenge and try to learn a minority language. This would uh, give you the instruments of basically working with this, working with the language community to support this language in the future. Now, Obviously, you can also, knowing some of this language, you can help develop educational materials in this language. So in the first place, which uh, the things that are easiest to produce, I believe, would be parallel texts. So you just create, take text available in this language and you provide parallel translation and maybe some comments. It can be transcripts of native speakers' talks. You just t make recordings of uh, conversations between native speakers or them telling some stories or whatever, then you transcribe this with their help, apparently. Again, you pr then produce parallel translation, and here you go, you have learning material. Videos with subtitles of the same uh, nature, so you can take videos with native speakers, record their talks, conversations, maybe some uh, kind of sp specifically filmed, played situations, why not? Uh, which you can again then supply with subtitles or with a written transcript. Polyglots, being usually public figures, many, many of them, many of us, uh, can attract public attention to the problem. They can appear on the media speaking of this, raising uh, social interest and social concern uh, about the problems of minority languages and their respective cultures. And finally, polyglots, uh, can act as facilitators, as so to say intermediaries between native communities, education systems, and, and the media. Because sometimes uh, native speakers, they don't have immediate access to uh, full-scale media or established academic systems to, in order to be able to cooperate with them to produce uh, syllabi, curricula, uh, learning materials for their languages, introducing courses of these languages into the education system. So a polyglot is someone connected both to education, to linguistics, to the larger social uh, sphere and the media could certainly help native communities do this. Because I remember at a conference uh, on language documentation and preservation several years ago in uh, Hawaii, native speakers would just come to uh, come up to linguists and say, well, we are speakers of this particular native language, we're not linguists. Well, you tell us what we should do to, in order to preserve our language. We don't know, we just speak it. This is our cultural heritage, we want to preserve it, but we don't know how this is done. You tell us how languages can survive, what can be produced in order to help the acquisition of these languages easy, and so on and so on. So having this expertise in both language acquisition and language use on different levels and different spheres, polyglots could definitely help native communities protect promote and hopefully develop for the future their native languages. So thank you for your interest and your attention. I just have a, an understanding question. You said something about 30 million words for the person to form the first language. When you say 30 million, you don't mean 30 million vocabulary items. No, no, of course not. There are not so many words in, in, in any given language. It means just words any, they're repeated, of course, right? It's just the number of texts, right? Text numbering to this, to this uh, figure, 30 million. But 30 million is, is just the data we have for four-year-olds, four-year-olds. I, I can't give you the figure for a 10-year-old child in, in, in the first language. It's just according to the data I have, I can say that 30 million seems to be an accurate, more or less accurate number for uh, the level of a four-year-old child in his or her first language. To, to find out more exact figures for other different ages, we need more research, basically. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, you, ma'am. I'm trying to speak up. Um, but is there like any platform that you know about that is not for uh, language learners, but for maybe also creators? Because I think what you said about our role as as polyglots is super, super, super important. That we cannot only.
really like create the material, but also like spread the word and make others learn the languages, right? Okay? So do you know about like any platform or anything like that to like well create a community between the creators? No, I don't really. I just heard yesterday one of the participants shared with me that there is a system or a database called Panlex, which contains uh, probably the uh, biggest number of well, available resources for uh, Panlex. Panlex. No, Lex from I guess from Lexicon, right? Lexis. Panlex, uh, which. According to this uh, person, he said that it contains the largest number of materials available for different languages, including dictionaries and so on. But again, it can be PhD dissertations, it can be articles, it can be dictionaries or something, so all kinds of materials. But he said that if you are to search for a particular language there, you can find something. You probably won't find more elsewhere. Thank you once again.